to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast with Borg, Betts, and a baller. Welcome in. It's Wednesday, August 23rd on the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ganoni, and I am joined by Matthew Betts and Jason Moore. Happy to be here. We've got a pretty cool show today. We've got, we got a good show, and we've got a lot going on around ballers' parts. I mean, a lot of stuff that our team, you know, we're making it to the season. We are limping our way forward. We have our injury expert, Betts, here to just diagnose every single issue with our team. But uh, I wouldn't say we're all at 100% right now. What's funny about that, Kyle, is that that's entirely accurate. <laughs> like, like obviously, NFL injuries, they're a big part of what we do. They're a big part of what I do. But there's probably, I would say, three days a week where someone in the company is messaging me, hey, Betts, injured my ankle playing pickleball. What do you think? The other day, Schneider actually <laughs> messaged me. He's like, hey, uh, how would you know if you injured your calf <laughs> playing pickleball? I was like, well... Let's talk through this, buddy. So, yes, I'm here for you guys. I'm here for the people, for the NFL injuries. We got to cover, boys. Don't worry. Usually, I would say, you know, not a doctor, shouldn't do anything, but you kind of get everything here. Um, and so, whether that's just simple, you know, hey, I have a cough, Bets. I know that you're a physical therapist, <laughs> but I, I know I have some issues. But we're trying to get to week one. And in Dynasty, it's even more important to say, like, hey, my team – It's had some ups and downs. We're going to talk preseason risers and fallers. There's some guys that I think people are nervous about, very nervous about, and and one particular that I want to bring up that I'm like, this did not go how I thought. But uh, we're limping along. Jason, you're here. You're going to make it, buddy. I am here. I am going to make it. My my voice is, I I, I would say we're at a solid 85%. Okay. And yeah, and that's good enough. When you got a voice as silky as mine. You need that silky smooth voice because we have a live show this weekend in LA. So Jason's going to be crowd surfing. And beyond just that, he's got some surprises for the people that I hope there's mm. no medical bills from this surprise. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a lot of insurance because of me. Uh, the insurance bill is going to be pretty high with the equipment I'm rolling in with. So it's going to be an amazing show at the Palace Theater in Los Angeles. So very excited. If you want to follow us, you can do that on Spotify, uh, on Apple Podcasts, on Twitter, on X. Jason is at JasonFFL. Betts is at the Fantasy PT. I'm at Kyle underscore Borg. And the Ultimate Draft Kit, it's available for those who say, hey, I cannot get enough Dynasty. I had some people this week that were doing a Dynasty startup draft. There's was Superflex, and then they even had tight end premium, and they said, hey, could your draft analyzer help me do that? Yes. You can do that. You can put whatever settings you want. You can change your scoring. Whatever you want to do, you get that in the Ultimate Draft Kit Plus. So if you want to do that, go to ultimatedraftkit.com to get that. But I really wanted to talk about the dynasty fallout from this Jonathan Taylor news. I wanted to start off before we talk about some of the preseason risers and fallers about Jonathan Taylor per Stephen Holder. The Colts are seeking a first-round pick, which... We can laugh about that if they're actually going to get a first-round pick for basically a one-year rental. But they did not get a first-round pick. (laughs) Ursa is just sitting there like, no, this is is what I'm going to get. I mean, it's just it's the typical dynasty manager, right? Like, I think he's worth this much, and the rest of the league's like, dude, we're not paying up. It's just ironic. He definitely plays dynasty with with his draft picks. (laughs) For sure he does, but it's just so ironic that he's like, I, I am not paying you. You are worth nothing. You're meaningless. But if you want to trade for him, it's going to cost you. He's so valuable. He's so good. Pay up for All him. All of a sudden, that ankle is looking pretty good out there, guys. <laughs> He's looking good. He's not injured. I promise. I had this question all up and down our Discord, and I wanted to get y'all's thoughts. It's kind of speculative you know, when we start talking about landing spots, but it's also super fun for a player that's entering a contract year, right? Like Jonathan Taylor is in our dynasty startup rankings is a top five running back. And I feel totally fine where we have him ranked. When we did the dynasty uh, top 10 running back ranking show, you start to look at the list. And I feel like this has been Jason's refrain for the entire year. It's like 
there's not many young dynasty running backs left on in the landscape when you start going past, you know, sixth, you know, we have Saquon, seventh, Josh Jacobs. It, it just, everybody's a lot older. And so Jonathan Taylor's one of those players that next year might be a different team. This year, it might be a different team. So let's throw it out there. This question came from Dilly on Discord. What team would you say is in contention for the Jonathan Taylor sweepstakes bets? I'll let you throw it out there. Maybe you can throw out one that you think this could happen and maybe another said, hey, this could be fun. I mean, we already have, I don't even want to call it news, but I forget the name of the beat reporter that covers the Dolphins had said, like, the team's interested. And I think that that's exciting. But they were in on the Dalvin Cook sweepstakes. They apparently had an offer out for him. So they kind of had been sniffing around these running backs saying, like, we might want to add someone. And now, you know, Devon A. Chain's banged up and he's kind of buried on the depth chart. So we'll see what shakes out. But it's just asking price, right? Like, they apparently were not willing to give Dalvin what he thought he could get, which kudos to him. He got a lot from the Jets. They weren't willing to give him that. And so, no, I don't think they're giving up a first round pick for Jonathan Taylor. But we have seen this team make some splashy moves recently, right? And last year, uh, brought in Tyree Kill. This season, they brought in uh, Jalen Ramsey. So uh, it's possible. But it's just a matter of of price and asking asking price, right? So I think that it could make sense. The tricky thing is like we're so close to the season. Like, do they really think they need to add someone? And they've kind of talked about being comfortable with their guys. So I, I don't know. I think that the Dolphins could make sense, but it's hard to see it for the asking price that the Colts reportedly want. Yeah, I, in the end, I do believe that Jonathan Taylor will play for the Colts this season, at least to start the season. Uh, we're so close to the start. The idea of a team in 2023 giving up what amounts to first round value plus a big contract, like I don't think you're going, you're you're certainly not trading away a first to have a one year rental on Jonathan Taylor. So the only way you're trading that draft capital is if you're also signing him to a long term deal. But that is so that's double dipping at the you know, quote unquote, least important position to pay up financially and pay up with draft capital for a running back late into, you know, preseason. It just seems impossible that it could get done. That being said, we do know that contending teams can be pushed over the top by, you know, the inclusion of a superstar running back. You just look at the San Francisco 49ers last year, um, you know, when Christian McCaffrey was kind of being shopped around. It was, look at the teams that were vying for him. The two main teams were uh, the 49ers and the Buffalo Bills. They both were like, hey, I think we are, you know, a, a superstar away from a Super Bowl. And so maybe a team like the Bills still is interested in acquiring a, a, a unique talent like Jonathan Taylor. It's interesting when I look at the odds <clears throat> right now in DK Sportsbook, the Bears are up there, and I've seen that thrown out a lot just because of the cap space and the depth chart. The Ravens would be such a slap in the face to J.K. Dobbins. Like, oh, and, yeah. Like, I started going down that and the emotional part of a player who thinks he's worth, you know, you know, a little bit more than what he's getting paid, wants to get an extension. You know, they're, they're both second-round picks, so they're due for something. Uh, so that one would be just devastating. I threw out Kansas City for fun. Because next year, they have $36 million in cap space. They've never really had a lot invested in the running back position other than they, they didn't pick up CEH's fifth-year option. So is it one of those things where they just say, hey, we didn't get it right the first time. Let's just, let's just get it right this time uh, from that draft. So that's a fun one. But look, That would come full circle for all of us Dynasty players who made the mistake of taking CEH over JT. Mm -hmm. That would just be so incredible. So for that reason, I, I sort of hope that happens. And honestly, for real life and, and for fantasy, that'd be absolutely incredible to see him in a backfield with Mahomes. But uh, yeah, man, we'll see. What do you think Dynasty managers should do with Taylor right now? Like, you have him on your team. Is he a hold that you're just like, hey, the landing spot has to be better than the Colts, right? Or is it one of those things where, like, hey, you could shop him right now because he's a hot name? Well, I mean, what would you want in return if you were a, a Taylor manager? Yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting question because the running back position, it's hard to capitalize on. It's one of those things where if you don't trade at a peak, um, then usually you want to hold and, and write out. So the question is, is Jonathan Taylor still at peak value? When I look at Dynasty startup rankings – you know, I moved Jonathan Taylor down 
um, with all this drama in our dynasty. He's he he started this off season as the number one uh, consensus, you know, before the Bijan draft at the NFL. Jonathan Taylor was pretty much the consensus uh, first running back off the board in dynasty leagues. Now I've got him behind both rookies. Um, I even have him behind Christian McCaffrey, which might sound weird for a dynasty league, but I look at like three-year windows, and I think Christian McCaffrey's still going to have a very good three-year window with his specific skill set. There's a lot of questions with Jonathan Taylor, but he's still a five. He is, he's the number five running back, so he could carry a lot. I think if you're going to shop him, what you're looking for is – a young stud wide receiver because you know I, I just think about it like if this was a startup draft Jonathan Taylor is usually going in the first round if it's not a super flex and I would much rather have first round wide receivers or probably even the second round wide receivers if it was a startup draft obviously once the leagues are going it's a matter of you know what is your roster construction do you need a wide receiver but I, I, that's what, how I would be looking to capitalize on Jonathan Taylor yeah, I agree on that as well. But if you are looking to invest, I do think you've got a kind of a little window here where like, let's say he does go to a team where he is no doubt getting an upgrade relative to like an actual NFL team perspective. I think we all can see the path where the Colts have some fun fantasy pieces, but aren't incredible this year. We know the rookie quarterback doesn't throw to the running back, you know, yada, yada. That's not great for Taylor. But like if he goes to somewhere where it's like, oh man, this is a great spot, his value will immediately skyrocket right back to being a top three, four option, like you said, dynasty, but also like the redraft ADP will have a huge bump. So you have a little window here where I think if you do want to just see what you can get, if you want to go get him, what, what it would take. I feel like you've got maybe a two week window just to see because it could go either direction, but that's part of the gamble that you play when you, when you trade away or trade four players in dynasty. So yeah, there's still so much to like about Jonathan Taylor, right? I know that right now it's, it's easy to be like, well, you know, the ankle and these contract issues, but like, man, He's not that far removed from an absolutely incredible ceiling, and he's so good. So I think I'd be willing to see what it takes to get him. I've had a lot of people also ask about the backup running backs with the Colts. We would probably na- label all of them as nasty, nasty boys. Mm-hmm. And do we care about any of these backups, to be honest? Like, do we care about Zach Moss, Evan Hull, Kenny and Drake, Deion Jackson, who looked really bad in the preseason? Do I, should I care? Um, I, I will say this, there will be fantasy points scored from every single team's running back position. So yeah, at some point you care in dynasty leagues, this is where you might be able to find players off of waivers. Uh, they're not good though. That's the problem. But the thing is, is sometimes you have to play nasty boys. Mike and I have won, uh, back to back championships. Well, I mean, back to back to back championships, but the last two years in championship week, we've been playing nasty boys. Two years ago it was Jarrett Patterson in our starting championship winning lineup. And I think a lot of people listening are like, who's Jarrett Patterson? Um, so you you need to be aware of those names. I do expect fully. Obviously, if they trade him, they're going to bring someone else in. They're going to sign Kareem Hunt or Leonard Fournette. I don't think there's a world where Zach Moss is the season-long leader of any team in the NFL. It's weird that Kenyon Drake still has life. I just want to throw that out there, like that he is still relevant to an NFL roster and then like potentially could be this team's starting running back. Is that wild? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is wild. <laughs> I mean, I don't I just he's one of those players where I thought I had his last dynasty legs 3 years ago and yet he's still popping up like for the Ravens like he was their guy for a while last year. And then for the Colts, like you could maybe get some, you could potentially get some flex worthy starts here. So it's gross. I think the, I think the take home is like these guys should be, should not be on a waiver wire. They could earn a role. It won't be efficient. It won't be great. But like Jason said, sometimes you need these guys just to help you like fill in a bye week, fill in an injury, get you eight to 10 points in a PPR league, something like that. So they should be rostered. Uh, we're not excited about any of them. All right. Let's talk about some of our favorite risers and fallers from preseason. Preseason power up. People usually clamor. Nay, they, you know, they, they ask all the time, can I please have more of the preseason power up drop? We use it once a year. So I thought this was the place to do it, to talk about risers and fallers from preseason. So we just had week two. Uh, we just had the Ravens and Commanders game. 
So kind of wrapped up week two, and we have some thoughts that we want to share about. Here's some players in our mind that have risen in perceived dynasty value. And I want to make sure I'm very clear about that point, especially when we get to the fallers. Dynasty is all about perceived value. It's like what your league is doing emotionally to say like this player is worth more because of what just happened, right? Like it's like when Terry McLaurin had his turf toe, uh, turf toe injury the other day, you had a brief window where everybody and their mama said Jahan Dotson to the moon and there is a perceived bump in value. And then a couple days later, we realized like, hey, this injury might not be as severe as we thought. So Dynasty is all about playing with emotions, about toying with your league, about trolling them, sending them as many puff pieces as possible. But the guys we're talking about today in our risers, I think what we're trying to say is this is a player that we're buying into for this season and maybe even beyond. So Betts, I will let you start first with a running back that is trending in the right direction. Let's hope the Bills do not trade for Jonathan Taylor <laughs> right as after the show is recorded. But I want to talk about James Cook, running back for the Bills. Uh, still, you know, not even 24 years old. He's entering his second year in the league. And I know we talked uh, with Mike months ago about James Cook saying, look, the Bills backfield really hasn't been that profitable for fantasy. You know, Josh Allen's going to take the goal line stuff. And we were like, if he's not getting that and they sign these veterans, where does the value come from? But it is very hard to ignore the the signs coming out of Buffalo. Like, man, James Cook's not only having an incredible camp on the field, but the seas are sort of parting for him to really take control of this backfield with Damian Harris still dealing with that lingering knee issue. Latavius Murray's about to be, what, 34 years old or something ridiculous. So it is not difficult to see the path for James Cook this year on an offense that should be top five in scoring. And specifically, this past week, week two of the preseason, um, he was on, on the field 15 out of 16 snaps with Josh Allen and the first team offense. All the short yardage stuff is really what I wanted to see because, like I said, the concern was, well, he can catch the ball, that's great, but like, is he just a between-the-20s guy? If he does get the high-value touches for this offense, I mean, that is is massive. So I've been historically lower on James Cook, but these last four or five weeks, like, I'm I'm getting very excited about James Cook and what he could be, and we're seeing that too in like the redraft ADP. He was a borderline like outside of the top 100 picks a couple months ago. He's all the way up into like the sixth, seventh round, which I think is right. So I am buying the James Cook steam. I'm very excited to see what he can do here in year two. It was hard to buy in, like when they drafted him, one because of his weight, and also just he never got a big workload in college, like with Zamir White at Georgia, and now it's like you can kind of put your head in the sand and say like, I just don't think he's built for it. You know, I don't think he's the archetype for it. And then you just look at this team, you look at the offense and say like, they've basically told us over and over again, they want this guy to get, you know, a good amount of touches. He's never going to be a 300 touch guy, but I don't think we really care for fantasy. I think my biggest question is what is he moving forward? Like value wise? Like if you wanted to trade for James cook, I feel like the manager is not going to want to give him up because running backs are really hard to come by. So, is he worth more than a, I don't know, mid to late first round pick, a uh, rookie pick? That seems pretty fair. In my opinion, I certainly would not be giving up more than that to get him. And and while I am very excited about Cook, we need to be clear. Like, I don't think any of us see a top 10 season for him. I'm not even sure top 12. So you're getting him as your RB2 if you've already got a couple locked in guys, RB3, which is great. But you know, we need to be realistic about that. So I certainly wouldn't be paying an early first or even a mid first. Probably I think late first is, is fair. Or maybe you want to package a player and an early second package a player and a late first, something like that, I think is, is somewhat fair, but I, you still be selective about it. You don't want to overreact to what's happened in the last couple of weeks, even though we are pretty excited. Do you feel like, so I'm just looking at some of the other running backs we have in our rankings. It's hard because the, the drop off is huge. There's the old guard, that is, you know, a bit ahead of him that we've kind of said Joe Mixon, uh, you know, Derrick Henry, the guys that are uh, above him in the rankings, and rightfully so. And then you have James Cook where you're like, okay, I think I'm going to get this year, probably get another year, you know, then his rookie contract. Like, he, he still has a lot of life left. So, Jason, would you rather have James Cook or Joe Mixon in a dynasty league? <laughs> that one is really, really interesting. Um 
I would I would take Joe Mixon in that situation, and here's why. Even though there's a four-year age gap to the benefit of James Cook and most dynasty players, they want to focus on youth and youth and youth and longevity. It's so crazy. If you go back and look at your dynasty rosters three years ago and who was playing and what you thought was going to happen with their careers and how many names you almost are like, oh, I forgot about him, and this is three years ago. This gap is not crazy. What I want is fantasy points and championships. And so Joe Mixon, even though he is a little bit older, he redid his contract this year. And the way that he did it, he basically he just gave money back. And he did it over two seasons. It leads me to believe that it is a negotiated deal that says he will be their starting running back this season and next season. And if that's true, which I believe it to be true, then I'll take two years of a workhorse back on Joe Burrow's team over the hope that like James Cook could certainly be worth far more than that. If James Cook hits and is awesome and, you know, is a top uh, 15 running back this season and then is young and could play like four or five more years as a top 15 back, then, then, then I, I lose in that deal and I should have gone James Cook over Joe Mixon. But the probability says that this year Joe Mixon is going to, significantly outscore James Cook in fantasy points and next year he's going to significantly outscore James Cook in fantasy points and if that happens I don't care about three years from now when Joe Mixon falls off by comparison to James Cook and then three four five years from now I'd be like oh well yeah sure at this point I would rather have James Cook than Joe Mixon um I but I will be like I'll be pointing to my championship rings and saying nah I'm good if I had to throw a wrench in anything with James Cook this year, which I, I don't even know wh- why we use that phrase, but if I had to throw one, a wrench at James Cook, <laughs> it's just the fact that the Bills, their running backs since Josh Allen's been there, have been a bottom five team in running back fantasy points score. It's just like you have an extra goal line back there. So the the route that it doesn't go so well for James Cook is that he's just between the 20s Josh Allen's never highly targeted the running back position, and he ends up with, I don't know, six total touchdowns, seven, and you're like, okay, he didn't quite hit his ceiling. I think his floor, though, like for your team, I think you have high in flex, RB2, which, you know, everybody's searching for that in Dynasty. So uh, if you drafted him last year, you know, where were people drafting him last year? Into the first in a rookie draft? Somewhere around there? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I feel like he was like, him and Damian Pierce were kind of right there at the end uh, of those rookie drafts. I think you're getting good return on that pick. And speaking of Damian Pierce, we're going to talk about him in just a second. So Jason, give me some reasons why Damian Pierce can be viewed as a dynasty riser. Yeah, so for me... If you've listened to the main show, um, the, the the footballer show, I spent this off season kind of waving a yellow caution flag on Damian Pierce. The the way that the season ended, what he did last season, it was just an incredible coming out party for him. He looked great. He played the part. He was very valuable from weeks three through thirteen last year. He was the running back thirteen, averaging twelve point six fantasy points per game. He had 19.9 opportunities per game, and it just seemed like, well, he's a home run. He's a guarantee. He's a young superstar up-and-coming running back. And I kept waving the yellow flag because I'm like, well, hold up. Historically speaking, really good running backs in the fourth round, when, when their team does not invest a day one or day two draft pick, if they're a day three draft pick, even when they hit, even when they are great their rookie year, almost always, I believe it was, it's been a month or two since I've done this research, but I think it was over 80% of the time, those good players dropped like 43 fantasy points on average the following year. And if you go through and you look at the actual names of who they were, it was like, guys, you just forgot. You're like, Jeremy Langford was one of them. Whew. When when you say that now, you're like, well, yeah, but Jeremy Langford sucks. No, we did not think that then. He had a great rookie year. He was super highly touted, but they didn't invest in him. And so it was like because the team wasn't invested in him, 
it's easy to go away from him. And so you saw that with, you know, Tyler Algier. Awesome rookie season. But the team was not invested in him, and then they get a chance to replace him, and they do. You know, so that can happen to Damian Pierce. I saw a new uh, regime come into town, and they brought in a good veteran running back in Devin Singletary. So to me, it was like, I don't think Damian Pierce is going to be the end all be all here. I'm going to bet on history and um and and the transactions that are being made with them bringing in another running back. But I say all of that to set the table for what we saw this preseason really does say I mean he appears to be their dude he appears to be to have won the job and in this preseason he he rested in week one which is you know a good sign a lot of these starters are resting in week one in week two he played all 14 snaps with the starters and this is the important part including eight routes run we ran a route on nearly 60 percent of the passing plays which would be close to elite for a running back and if you don't realize this he did so little of that last year he was not used in the passing game he was not used on third down uh Rex Burkhead was the man on third yeah. down yeah his <laughs> sexy Rexy um and so it's one of those things where it looks like already in preseason he was on the field in third and long he was on the field in situations where he just was always off the field last year He's talented. I have my my argument against Damian Pierce has never ever ever been that he's not a good running back. He you watch the film and you're like that dude is a good running back. So if he's a good running back and he's got the utilization, which it appears because of the preseason that he does, I I'm in now. I I think he's I think he's going to be good. I still do caution. I I will say, you know, from a dynasty lens, the argument of the lack of investment is still there. You just got to go to Jordan Howard to see that. Jordan Howard was good his following year, right? He was, he came out of nowhere in the fourth round, and he was uh, a solid running back, and then he was good again. And still, after a couple years of being good, he was just exposable, just you know, replaceable because the team still wasn't invested. So I don't think him having a great season this year guarantees him four or five more years of superstardom in the NFL. I now do believe he's going to have a good season this year, and you have to do that in order to have a chance at having a run at a uh, long-term value. That's a good point because, yeah, beyond this year, there's still so many unknowns. That's why we kind of it's really hard for us to project that far. But everything says that he's he's going to be the dude here, and I, <laughs> Betts knows that I've been pretty anti Damian Pierce for a while, and it wasn't because of the talent. I never said he was bad at the game. It was how much steam he got last year in redraft, how how high he went. And when you just look, like Jason mentioned, like he was barely used on third downs. He was on the field for 18 total pass snaps on third down the entire year. He ran 12 routes on third down last year. It was like he was third on the team. He was even behind Daria Agumbawale. So if this preseason, if this is what he's doing, like this usage on third down, then this is awesome. And I love this quote. Uh, people are asking him, hey, have you uh, been more involved in the passing game? He's like, yeah, because I had to lose a ton of weight if I'm going to stay Yes, up with this I system. love that. I, I, I'm so happy you found that quote. I had not seen that quote, Kyle, the fact that he was losing weight to, to, to run routes. We talk about this um, you know, pretty frequently, but I, I love when a running back loses weight. That is uh, when they come in as a good beef boy and then they – Mm. Lean, lean up and get that speed. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> Bets, give me a you know just a good valuation. I'm looking at other running backs we have in our rankings right now that are around him. You know, Zach Charbonnet, Derrick Henry, the aforementioned Joe Mixon. Is he kind of like ahead of that group? Like, is he top fifteen dynasty running back? Kind of like pretty close to that. I think that's a pretty fair evaluation. Right on that that cutoff mark is is definitely fair and you can move those guys up and down a spot or two or three depending on your personal preference but he's certainly in that tier uh for me you know like you said not just watching him play last year but the numbers back it up right i mean number one in elusive rating you know pff minimum uh, 100 carries like above nick chubb and, and guys like that like he was awesome and then fourth most uh missed tackles and the dude missed what a month at the end of the season roughly with the ankle issue so the numbers 
losing weight, just this, he is going to be the centerpiece of the offense, certainly. And you're getting that added, added, uh, you know, second year bump. Like that's when these guys break out is year one and year two for running backs. If it doesn't happen by that second year, like typically it's not going to happen. And so he's kind of hitting that peak of like, we could see a jump forward here. So yeah, I think that's a very fair evaluation. I would certainly uh, not have any qualms if anyone wanted to rank him in the top 15, top 13, depending on your preference for those guys. He's also just a fun player to watch because he just hurts people. Like he just runs over. He's he's the Chris Carson where you're like, okay, you are just going to, he's smaller than Chris Carson. Chris Carson is the biggest running back ever, but just running through people. And that's the, that's the only thing I'll say too. That type of style is really hard to hold up, but really fun player. And even if the team's bad, 20 opportunities a game is just nuts if you're going to get that for your team. So I want to bring up one more running back. And I feel like I've been teetering bringing this up with bets. You know, it's don't know if I want to. I don't have a medical degree, but I need to bring up Javante <laughs> Williams because of what I saw in preseason was not what I was told, or at least what I thought. Just if you would have asked me in March, I, I wrote this down. I said, if someone said, hey, what's his percentage chance of playing week one? I think I would have put it at like 10 to 15 percent. Like, where where were you guys at way back in March in terms of? Oh yeah, I, I was I was the same. So talk to us, Mister Medical Man. Well, Kyle, do you want to lay out your case first, or you want me to chime in? Because I don't want to, I don't want to sway your discussion. No, no, here no. One way or the I other. actually would rather hear the medical part because mine is just more of like what he did in week two and his usage, and just to like dispel any anybody that's scared of like, oh, Samaj P Ryan had way more third down snaps. Um, so just like. I know we can't like fully understand a player's medical journey, everything else going on, but like, is this like way further ahead than almost anybody else is projecting? Because I didn't see anybody saying, "Oh, he's going to be week two of preseason like dominating touches." Yeah, I think the fact that he's even out there, like you don't have to look at the box score. Just the fact that he's on the field in week two of the preseason is an awesome sign, and it's not just been this one thing that we've gotten right. It's been like a consistent, steady report of good news, which is awesome. For Javante Williams and I think the fact that he's on the field you know no one really talks about this in our space because it's hard to quantify but there is a confidence thing at play for a lot of these guys that you can't really put a number on but like I guarantee you he going into the week coming out of it not re-injured uh taking a few hits breaking a couple tackles running some routes they may not have been perfect but like from a confidence standpoint that does wonders for an athlete so that all is awesome news for Javante Williams I think the tricky thing is that no matter what you think about the injury or where he's at, there's no question this is going to be a committee backfield this year, assuming both guys stay healthy throughout the year. And the one thing that I was always, I think, hesitant about with other guys coming off ACL injuries is a lot of these guys are two down grinders, right? And it's like, do I want that if they're not efficient, seeing less volume? Probably not, right? But I think his floor this season will be a little bit more insulated than usual because of the receiving work and like you said it's not just the third down stuff dude saw five targets he was out there running like wide receiver routes a couple times in that game and we know last year russell wilson checked it down a ton sean payton wants his running backs involved out of the backfield so i still don't think you're getting a ceiling season from javante williams but certainly i think the floor is higher than we thought it would be and you know the receiving work will definitely help that so i am cautiously optimistic but we need to remember if he does have a great season it is going to be an outlier and that's just kind of the reality of the situation so i'm more in than i was four or five months ago but i'm not ready to be like oh javante williams rb1 season here we go but from a dynasty perspective this is awesome news yes and this is kind of what we've been buying into like okay it's probably going to be slower this year and then you can buy into 2024 but it's now it's like oh well, maybe we're getting a little bit you know a little bit more i just want to talk about his usage in week two of the preseason, he saw 13 snaps. Samaj P. Ryan saw 11. And one of the things that kind of I saw put on my timeline is that Samaj P. Ryan had six third down snaps and Javante only had one. But these two gentlemen right here on the podcast, Jason and Betts, have heard me say this mm -hmm. maybe a little too much. Not I've enough. Really? Because I just, this is the one thing that I went down the rabbit hole and I just want to tell people. I don't think third down snaps matter at all in the sense of how we're projecting or what we're telling ourselves. You know, it's it's easy to say like, oh, they're there on third down. They're going to get all the passing work. 
if you just look at running backs in general, and I have an article coming out that's called The Myth of the Third Down Running Back in Fantasy oh, Football. Oh, nice. It's 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 an opus. Just dunking on people, Kyle. Oh, I'm just going <laughs> to tell everyone that they should just log out. If they even hear anything about third down, log out. Maybe no. you, you will win article of the year for the second time, Mr. Borgognoni. Ooh. That's my way of giving you dap for article of the year. Good stuff. Dang, I need to work on this one more, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm expecting big things now, Kyle. So one of the things that we need to understand about running backs is that so much more happens on first and second down than we realize because the plays start over if you get a first down you go back to first down so there's just way more first second downs in general but if you just look at what correlates to fantasy football points that's what i that's all we care about right it's just yeah. how does this correlate so last year all right f- first down percentage snaps so if you're in there on first down for your team for the running back position the correlation was super strong okay i'm giving some dirty numbers 0.79 second down 0.74 third down percentage of snaps 0.2 Fine. Wow. It, it's it's almost like irrelevant. It's almost like doesn't even matter to the point of not a when, sticky stat at it's, all. It's not sticky. And when you look at how running backs are targeted on third down, a lot of times running backs are asked to pass block, which doesn't count as a route and you're not going to get targeted when you're pass block. And all I care about is are they targeted when they're out there? And when you look at running backs last year, running backs as a whole were targeted on 22.6% of their first down routes, 22% of their second down routes, and only 17% of their third down routes. So my point is, not just with Javante, but I think it's a bigger point in general. When you hear the phrase, somebody's a third down back, like, oh, Chase Edmonds is going to be the Buccaneers' third down back, or Chris Evans is going to be the team's third down back. A lot of times it's pass blocking, and pass blocking is not good for fantasy football. I don't want my running back pass blocking. I want him running a route which is why Chris McCaffrey is a cheat code. He is awesome on third down. He's awesome on first. He's awesome on second. He's just awesome. So with this team, I think Samaja is going to get some third down work. But Javante had five targets in this week two preseason game, and they were all you know early downs. So if he's getting early down work and getting targeted on early downs, he's going to be awesome. Do you guys remember, was it week one last year against the Seahawks? He had like 10 targets. Like he was just over and over and over again they were using him. So... That was on that uh, incredible Monday Night Football game, wasn't it? Before we thought, when we thought the Broncos would be good, <laughs> it's wasn't it? that was when the Broncos had like five million chances inside the red zone, just kept screwing it up, and, yeah. and eventually lost. So, what is y'all's temperature on Javante? I just went on my little, you know, third down diatribe, but well, I I want to just add two things to the third down diatribe: one pro and one uh, against. the The perfect example here for Javante with P Ryan playing third downs is if you look at last year, there was a player named uh, Samaj P. Ryan who <laughs> w- was in basically the exact same role. He uh, he was playing more third downs than Joe Mixon. You know, he was the, he's the third down back. And if you look at the total receptions, you had Mixon, who missed a couple games, with 60 receptions, and you had P. Ryan, the third down back, with 38 receptions. So, yeah, you want to be on first and second down. However, the one the one caveat is – sometimes maybe oftentimes I don't have the data enough to declare definitively that it's often but uh, it feels in my in my heart that oftentimes the third down back is the two minute drill back and in that case I feel like there are there, I, I wish there was a way to maybe maybe you've got the data on this Kyle you could put an article out in the future but um, I feel like there is value to be had on being the two minute drill Jared back McKinnon. Exactly. There's, there's so that's when you're not just staying into pass block. That's when, you know, you've, you've got to play fast. You've got to snap the ball, check it down. You know, you see those, those drives at the end of a half or at the end of a game where it's like, oh yeah, the running back caught the ball four times on this one drive and maybe got the touchdown at the end. So there's some value there. No, that definitely would be taking things a bit further because who shows up in third down points last year? It's Jarrett McKinnon year before. Brandon Bolden led all running backs in third down fantasy points. So there is there are certain archetypes of players that you would say, hey, this is what they do. But with Javante, because it's like this offseason, you would have felt bad trading him away. And now we're at the point where it's like, I kind of want to try to acquire this guy because I think he's a little bit ahead of schedule. So Betts, what what could I what would I offer to get Javante? Like it feels like it needs to be a first rounder plus something else. 
Yeah, that's probably what it's going to take. The tricky thing is like we've we've kind of said the pros and cons of kind of where he's at. And my still, you know, high level take is like I think you're getting a fine solid running back this year potentially. But like he's not 100% yet. And so if you're trading assets away and you're thinking I'm getting this win now piece, are you really? Like I, maybe, I don't know. And that's super risky, right? If you are trying to go in to win this year at the same time, I think next year, Javante is going to be awesome. So uh, it's sort of a team dependent thing, right? Like I would feel comfortable trying to get this guy if I was, you know, a year away, maybe something like that. If you're like, I got a couple solid guys in my squad, but I'm not really ready to go all in. I think Javante is a great target. If you are a top one or two team, I mean, if you've got expendable assets to get him, great. But like the tricky thing is if you're trading for him and you're you're thinking you're getting this RB1 season, I, I just, I still don't see it. So it's a really tough conversation in terms of his value. I just want to throw out a couple other quick uh, risers that we have. Kendry Miller looked awesome, looked explosive, yeah. kind of. What, uh, what a roller coaster with him because right. it was like he was one of my absolute favorites in the pre-draft process. Then he was injured for the combine and all that. I assumed he wasn't going to be drafted high, so he wasn't super high in my rankings. But then he was drafted high in the second round, so I was like in on him. But then he was missing camp and missing everything with, you know, he's still injured, so I was like a little lower on him. And then he gets back, He's and he's looking good in camp, and I'm like, yay, oh, no, he, he injured his knee, the same knee, so now this is going to really be bad. And then he's back again, and kick, catching that that wheel route was unbelievable, yes. and he is not a guy known. like that, that. He can catch the ball, obviously. You watch that play, and you go, oh, yeah, that guy could catch. But that isn't what he's known for. He's known for being, you know, um, uh, just a people mover, a fast breakaway guy. Like, he's just... He's really, really good. Kendra Miller is someone that dynasty people need to be targeting because he's just super good. I'll yeah. also throw out Jalen Warren. That was the player I was going to talk about today. He had that 60-plus yard breakaway run uh, in week two preseason, but he was my sleeper uh, pick on the, the main show yesterday, so I didn't want to double dip. If you want to hear more about Jalen Warren, go listen to the, the uh, Fantasy Footballers Tuesday episode. Bets, any quick names you want to throw out there just just quickly of, of a riser from preseason? Any other names? I mean, what a week for the Nasty Boys. Am I right, Kyle? Like, we had the show last week. Cole Turner's out there on Monday Night Football catching passes. Deontay Hardy's out there in the slot. That was Mike's boy. We got some news, potentially, that Chris Evans is ahead of the other guys. So it's just a great week for the Nasty Boys. I want to point that out. And I'm very proud of the Foot Clan because those were like the top four or five names trending on Sleeper for the last week. So good job to all of you. Um, but Khalil Herbert, I think deserves a nod of like, you know, I get the love for Roshan Johnson and dynasty. I just think what there was question marks, like, could it be Deonta Foreman? Maybe could it be Khalil Herbert? Who knows? But the actions of the Browns are the, uh, the bears, excuse me, have told us this is Khalil Herbert's shot to be the RB one. So he's at least getting the nod out of the gate. So Khalil Herbert's value, I think has gone up in the last month or so. And I just wanted to mention Jackson Smith and Jigba. I almost brought him up and then we got news of him, uh, having surgery. Was it his wrist? Yeah, he, he broke his wrist on a great, awesome play where it looked like he should have scored, but it was it was another big bomb. Uh, I'll call it touchdown. It wasn't. He got tackled at the one, but uh, yeah, he broke his wrist on that, had surgery yesterday, and nobody should care at all about this. That is my opinion. Bets, you can weigh in medically, and I'm talking not just Dynasty, but Redraft. Certainly Dynasty. Like, uh, this is... You know, I, I'm not. I was never expecting Jackson Smith and Jig, but the best wide receiver in this draft class, who is going to be special and awesome, both in the NFL and fantasy. I was never expecting him to come out and uh, just dominate week one, week two, week three, week four. Like that. This is the beginning of his career, where he's playing alongside DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. So to me, the fact that he might be ready for week one, maybe he won't be. Maybe it delays his career a couple weeks. Like. No, who was drafting him specifically for week one and week two? That's you, Kyle. You were just drafting him for week one and week I, two. I have an auction team where somehow he ends up being my wide receiver two, and I was counting on oh, him. Oh man, I know my team is so top heavy. It's not. I even mean, I I will say this from memory. I believe the first two weeks <laughs> the schedule is so good. It's Rams I, and it, Lions. Rams and Lions. That's right. Goodness gracious. So I was uh, yeah. Real quick before we move on from from JSN, I, I 
totally agree from a medical perspective. No concerns. He might miss a game. He might miss two, might miss three, whatever. But like, this is a guy you want on your squad for the next eight years, not the first three weeks of the season. Uh, and he he just looked incredible. And it's hard to put into words. Like, he's everything we thought he would be. The numbers back it up. The tape backs it up. The camp reports back it up. Yeah, he's he's going to be a dude. And, and, he- and, and if there is some look, I know most leagues you're you're going to roll your eyes at this, but we've got a wide enough audience that we say dumb things sometimes, and then people come back and thank us because the dumb things worked in their league. Go try to trade for JSN right now while he's got a broken wrist because maybe a manager would go, oh, that sucks. He broke his wrist. Oh, he doesn't, I'll bet he doesn't even know that he knows you know, that his wrist is broken and, and take advantage of it. So injury prone. Oh. All right. <laughs> yeah. Already. Uh, he didn't just play in 11 personnel. I think that was another cool thing. But you got to see him also mix in outside. So he's going to be a dude. He's going to be awesome. And the thing that we brought up, is where is this guy going to be drafted next year in redraft? Like he's going to be a round two, round three pick. Like he's he's going to be awesome. He's going to be a ah, I can't wait. So before we get to followers, let's take one more break. All right, we mentioned some risers, and we're talking about fallers once again. This is perceived dynasty value. You know, some of these players over the summer might have been players you'd be like, yes, I want to buy into this guy. I like his outlook. I like his opportunity. And if you were to try to trade them away right now, people might say, hey, you know what? Did you see what just happened preseason? So we're not saying a follower is somebody we don't want at all on our dynasty squads. It's just they might not be as valuable right now. So keep that in mind. But bets, I will let you start off with a wee little man. Yes, this is a smaller gentleman. His name is Rondell Moore. And I wanted to bring up potentially Michael uh, Wilson as a riser, and this kind of correlates. You know, the tricky thing with Rondell Moore is that when he entered the league, I feel like he was drafted for a specific role, right, in Cliff Kingsbury's system. Smaller guy, slot wide receiver, and then we kind of did see a little bit of him in two wide receiver sets last year. Um, But that seems unlikely to happen this year for a team that I think – as long as Kyler is out, is going to lean on James Conner. And so if you're having Michael Wilson out there in two wide receiver sets across from Hollywood Brown, and oh, by the way, Zach Pascal rotating in because this regime brought him in. And look, Zach Pascal isn't anything special, but I think he's a pretty good blocker, and I feel like they kind of like that, like coaches like that in him. But that's their guy. They brought him in. And you've got these two tight ends in Trey McBride and Zach Ertz who are going to play. Like, I-, I just find it tough to see the path for Rondell Moore at all. And you said at the top of the segment, you don't want these guys in your dynasty roster. Or maybe you don't feel that way. I don't want, want Rondell Moore on my dynasty roster. It, he's not the guy this coaching staff wanted. They're inheriting him. He's going to be playing only in three wide receiver sets. And so I just, I don't know, man. I, it's tough for Rondell Moore. These young wide receivers who flash a little bit, you get excited about them in year two. I, I'm even more excited about like, you know, Romeo Dobbs entering year two. And last year with Ron, Rondell Moore, he didn't really show us another step forward. I think we kind of know what he is at this point. I feel like he still carries a little bit of value because of his name. And there was people that were super excited about, you know, the, the 40 time and the, the speed score and stuff like that. But man, I, I don't think he's ever going to be a true fantasy contributor on a consistent basis. So I would be willing to move on from around more now. Honestly, I, I think his value is, is sinking like a ship. Jason, you are our resident, you know, beat reporter in Arizona. I mean, that's your, mm-hmm. that's your thing. Like right. this is a whole front fantasy footballers just so you can get inside information. So what, what are you hearing? I know Michael Wilson has been kind of a yeah. steady drum. What what I'm hearing is Michael Wilson, Michael Wilson, Michael Wilson. He is maybe the only, uh, rookie wide receiver who, in fact, I think he is. I think he is the only, tell me who I'm wrong on. I think he is the only rookie wide receiver who will be starting week one, as one of the primary two wide receivers, probably playing near a hundred percent of uh, passing down snaps, the, the, regardless of formation, because JSN, Jordan Addison, uh, Quentin Johnston, Zay Flowers, they all kind of project to be the third at best come week one, and I, you know, I could see them, you know, winning over that job. But Michael Wilson 
is already he the entire camp he's just been running with the ones and he's a big guy he's six two two hundred he's not one of these itty bitty baby boys like Hollywood Brown and um you know and like Rondell Moore so they like him they drafted him and the nice thing is he's been dominating granted it's very easy to dominate Arizona's <laughs> defense uh but Still better to go out there and succeed than to go out there and fail. And so he has been succeeding, and he had good draft capital. It's so funny. In the dynasty world, the dynasty community cares so much about our opinions before the NFL draft that it sticks forever, for too long. Not forever, but for too long. For instance, Terry McLaurin was someone when he was coming out that was not a super highly thought of prospect before the NFL draft by the by the dynasty community. Now, the NFL was like this is a really good player. I'm going to draft him high with high draft capital and it took the dynasty community too long to catch up to what the NFL was telling us. But with Michael Wilson, the NFL's telling us we believe he is worthy of a day 2 draft pick. And he went ahead of a lot of other wide receivers that we were talking about all off season, and he's been dominating, and he's running with the ones. So yeah, I mean, he, if if he's there and Hollywood is there, and the Cardinals are going to suck, why would Rondale Moore be someone of any note or value whatsoever? So I'm, I'm completely with bets. I I don't care about Rondale Moore almost in the slightest. Uh, and you might be able to get something for him. There were a lot of Rondell Moore truthers, advocates, people that were crazy in love with him. I think the problem with Michael Wilson is he's just too smart for his own good because in our profile, when it says class, it doesn't say he's a freshman or a sophomore or a junior or a senior. It says he's a graduate student, and mm. and we have something against From Stanford. That. Yeah, apparently. Smart kids out there. Apparently we have something against education, which, uh, you know, I'm a graduate. I was a graduate student. We've, I think we've all been graduate students. Wow, too. flexing over there. Goodness. <laughs> you, too, I think you both have, Kyle's too. so cool. Well, dude. yeah, we have it, but we're not flexing it. We're not like, I'm a graduate just student. bragging about it. I just wanted to tell Michael Wilson that it's okay, man. I get it. Like We like the young hotness, but maybe, maybe this year, maybe in 2023 NFL for at least the Cardinals, what they need is a, you know, an old man, an old man as a rookie. Yeah, and, and and let me be clear. This isn't me saying Michael Wilson will dominate, will be great. You need to go target him and overpay to get him. This is saying that he will run ahead of Rondell Moore and make Rondell Moore pretty darn irrelevant and that he has a chance to be good because he is a 23-year-old. Uh, you know, he's old for a rookie, and he's, again, playing against the Cardinals. So th that's, that's my thought on the Cardinals situation. Who's your faller, Kyle? Mine's Greg D., and mm, I don't I don't like it. Greg D in terms of perceived value right now, it's not looking good. Who thought that, you know, Adam Troutman would be the thing to KO him in people's minds. But I do want to just at least lay out why Greg D is not done. And so, so far the, the story has been Adam Troutman is the starting tight end because he's getting more snaps in preseason and he's just a better blocker. And that's, that actually is true. But for tight ends, we actually care. Jason laid out this for uh, your Mark Andrews, my guys case, right? Like we don't really care about tight ends that are really good pass blockers because if they're pass blockers, they're not running a route. And right now in preseason, Greg Dulcich has run a route on just 62% of dropbacks, which is lower than what he did last year. Last year it was 70%. And just to give you some context, he's one of five rookie tight ends since 2000 to hit that mark. That's like a really big deal as a rookie to not be asked just to pass block. Like He was strictly on the field last year to catch passes. In preseason, he has zero pass blocks. Okay, so they're not asking him, which is great. Um, and he only did it 12 times last season. So I think what we're seeing so far is that on limited snaps, it just looks lower and it looks really gross. But he did last year the things we care about, which is he's athletic and he has those yak moments where he gets down the field. That's all I care about. I don't think you can go into week one saying he's a starting tight end and feel confident in a 12-person league, but I don't think you should abandon him immediately and say, Greg Dulcich is is nothing. Like All we saw last year is that this is what you want in tight end. He's not he's not uh, Jack Doyle, right? Like turn around, get the ball, fall down. Tiny hands. 
Yeah, Greg D, I've seen his hands. Great hands. And Sean Payton was quoted yesterday as saying, we're still installing new packages for Greg Dulcich on third down and in the red zone. And last year, this team was the worst in the league on third down and in the red zone. You remember how bad they were. So I'm not ready just to say he's done, but his perceived value has gone down. And I wanted to kind of check y'all's temperature. Would you rather have Greg Dulcich or Trey McBride in Dynasty? <laughs> That's funny. Um, I would go with Greg Dulcich. I think he showed enough, and I am not – I. This is this has been a stubborn one, right? Because if you watch preseason, um, you are right. His stock has fallen. The way that they're using him snap count wise and personnel package wise is very upsetting. It says that it's pointing to him not getting utilized the way that we just flat hoped he would get utilized. But I'm being stubborn here. I I I think that they might be hiding him. I think that they are running a vanilla offense, that they're not really running whatever Sean Payton's wanting to do going forward. And I think when week one comes, you're going to see a lot of utilization of Greg Dulcich. And I'm I'm making that bet just based on the talent we saw on the field. Uh, some of Sean Payton's quotes about the talent he was seeing on the field from Greg Dulcich. And I think that they can do some special things with him. Uh, and so I... I I, I recognize and fully admit that it is stubbornness in the face of evidence that I refuse to lower Greg Dulcich in my belief on both redraft and dynasty outlook. Um, and I wasn't like some, I, I don't think Greg Dulcich is going to be the, the, you know, the next greatest tight end of all time. I just think he's really solid, a, a huge playmaker, and he will continue to be, you know, a, a top half tight end one I think that's where he can get to now even top half tight end ones that sounds phenomenal it's not that great like if you finish as the tight end six you were bad for half the year because there's pretty much two or three tight ends that are good all year um but I I I, uh, I think he's talented we saw too much on the field to to go away from that based on two preseason games utilizations I agree I feel like this is kind of a savvy take like right now everyone's panicking because it wasn't that long ago we had Sean Payton telling us about Greg Dulcich being the Joker role. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, Greg Dulcich is going to be incredible this year. And now everyone's like, oh man, oh well. Like it's it's Albert O all over again in Denver. But like you said, we, we at least saw it from Greg Dulcich last year. And it wasn't just the fact that he was out there specifically as a pass catcher. It was earning targets down the field, which tight ends just don't do. Like a 12.7 ADOT is awesome. That was a top 10 mark in the NFL, in the NFL for tight ends last year for Dulcich. So we saw it. We're getting the year two bump and the comparison to Trey McBride, right? We just, we didn't really see that much last year. It really took uh, a lot for him to overcome. It took a, a Zach Ertz injury to get on the field, truthfully. So I, I want to still be in on Greg Dulcich for the profile. And I think right now is the time that you capitalize on this perceived negative news. I'd be floating a second out there and seeing if I can get him on my team and, and hoping for the best. I fully recognize that the the mental exercise Jason just did and my own personality is everybody's going this way with Dulcich. Let me figure out another way to go just to see if I can, you know, buck up against that trend. Uh, so I had this question. I wanted to throw out one more. Uh, this was from our Discord. They said in a tight end premium league, we'd rather have Dulcich, Luke Musgrave, and I'm going to throw in Chig because I love Chig. It, uh, they're kind of they're all pretty close to me. Yeah. Mm, that's tough. Pick they, a flavor. They, they are <laughs> all so they close. are all pretty close. I think that uh we saw it, Greg Dulcich and Chig Akonquo flashed in their rookie season. But we saw more from Greg Dulcich than we did from Chig. The passing volume should be higher there. Um and so I, I would I would go Greg Dulcich over Chig. The real question is Musgrave I, I usually hate in dynasty I just hate dealing with rookie tight ends I feel like you're just wasting an entire year um Musgrave's opportunity does seem great I I, I think I will go I think I'm gonna go Dulcich Chig Musgrave final answer Bets, give me an order I think I would go Chig Dulcich Musgrave but it's it's super close yeah I'm I'm probably still gonna stay with Chig in my own priors because 
I'm a stubborn man. But Jason, give us one more faller. Yeah, so this is I, I want to I want to caution you to hear what I'm saying and not what just the title of the segment is. My my faller uh, through the preseason was Christian Kirk. And this is not me saying Christian Kirk is going to be irrelevant or terrible, but he has certainly fallen in what I believe he is to this team and what my expectations were based on what we've seen in the preseason. Um, you know, I think before the NFL kicks off, it was fair to say, are we sure that Calvin Ridley's really the one? Uh, obviously, you know, the the ADP says that the community believes Calvin Ridley is the, the primary target um, over Christian Kirk. But it's a fair question to say, well, look, Christian Kirk was awesome last year. He was the number one target last year. And you got a guy who hasn't played football in a couple of years coming in. I, and, and sure, the camp reports are good, but is it really impossible that Christian Kirk can't still be the number one target and, and Calvin Ridley the number two? So that was a question that I thought was fair. Well, now I don't. Now I don't believe it's fair because you saw when they went to uh, you know two wide receiver sets, you would expect Christian Kirk on one side and Calvin Ridley on the other, and that wasn't what we were getting. Christian Kirk was off the field, and you had Zay Jones there uh, on the outside. And so I don't want to overblow that because, you know, 70-plus percent of their snaps will be three wide receiver sets with this team. When they're in two wide receiver sets, they're going to be running a lot. So the majority of plays for fantasy purposes, Christian Kirk will still be out on the field. But what I have come to realize is that it is a definite to me. It is it has been answered before the NFL season that it is a, a definite and clear Calvin Ridley is the primary target for this offense. He is the number one wide receiver. Christian Kirk is going to be a valuable slot wide receiver. And that's what he is for this team. He's good at that role, and that's great. Uh, but last year, Christian Kirk was what, like the wide receiver 13? And I, I think that's right. You can correct me if I'm I think wrong. he was 11. Oh, okay, so e even better. So he was, you know, okay, a wide receiver one last season. And I don't believe that, you know, you, you look a couple years ago when he was basically a slot wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals playing behind DeAndre Hopkins. Um, he was very good. He was a wide receiver two. He's like the wide receiver 23. And so I think that is more his ceiling. Uh, versus being able to be a wide receiver one anymore. And so that's why he's dropped to me. He's not dropped to irrelevance or, or, or you know, he's bad or he's a bust. But he's not the number one. He won't be the number one. I think we just – so we probably just saw his best season, wide receiver 11 finish. But it doesn't mean that all of a sudden he's just going to fall off the map. Like, he's under contract for three more years. And when you look at his contract, it's a real three years. Like, often we'll say that and we'll go, ah, well, there's a clause. Think, like, it is – there's a lot of money – and his agent did a really good job. He's only 26 years old, and if he does go into more of the slot mode, like I think that you're going to get some high end wide receiver two, you know, flex type seasons that are super valuable. Like don't just discredit him in an offense that we like because he's going to miss, you know, four to five snaps here and there. It's 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 super valuable. He actually caught, he got an end zone look and got a touchdown. He saw, you know, in the preseason like third down and a fourth down target. So it's like. He's a super valuable player. He's dependable. And I think you saw this when you are in Arizona. It's just like he looked like he belonged on the field. It just took the team a while to figure out how to utilize him when there was other targets on the team. But, yeah, I, I, I'm I fine with Christian Kirk, what he is, though. I think people are never going to get wide receiver one, like flirt with that ever again. Very fair. And I think right now, like, you could probably, even though he just had that incredible fantasy season, I don't know that he's really valued that way. And so I think if you're realistic with it and say, look, I'm probably getting a very solid, I mean, he could give you wide receiver two numbers, but I think he's largely like valued in the dynasty community as like a fringe two, three guy. So like I, I'd still be comfortable getting him for my squad. I want to buy into Trevor Lawrence. I want to buy into that offense taking another leap forward. So I like what you guys are saying, just being realistic with the ceiling. It's not what it was last year. I think is, is the take home. All right. I'll give you a couple of names real quick before we get out of here. We'd rather have Christian Kirk, or George Pickens in Dynasty. And I feel like most people are going to yell and say, of course it's George Pickens. He's younger. He's more exciting. Who would you rather have? I That's so tough. It, it is actually tough. It is a, I went back and forth a little bit, but um, I am going to go George Pickens. I'm not going to scream it. I don't think it's an easy slam dunk here. I, 
the way that I view it is probability says that Christian Kirk will score more fantasy points than George Pickens this season. And and that matters a lot because they're both young enough to where I, I'm not just taking the age into account. So probability of medium out, median outcome is on Christian Kirk's side. But I just talked about how I think Christian Kirk's ceiling is capped. And I'm wanting to have the chance at getting a superstar. So I'll take Pickens. I think that was a perfect explanation. I would, I would largely agree. Yes, I, almost, I did it. <laughs> what about, would you rather have Kirk or... Rashad Bateman, who we have seen 18 games, and we're just like still waiting. I would take Kirk in that situation personally. I think uh, what I've seen from Zay Flowers, he looks incredible, man. And he's they're they're financially committed to him. I know they are to to to, uh, to uh, Bateman as well. But at some point, you know, you have to have so many chances to do it, and it just hasn't happened for one reason or another. And so I think I would take Kirk in that situation. I think I I lean uh, yeah I think it's all three of us lean on the Kirk side when you go into year three and you're still needing to prove it and I know a lot of it's been injuries but you just don't get chances Part of the equation. you don't get chances forever and Zay Flowers just I think he's that dude with Ravens camp this year it's been interesting because we've gotten so many different reports of early on. When they asked Lamar who the wide receiver one was, he said it was Rashad. And then obviously Flowers just looked amazing. And then OBJ has been talked up. It's like, okay, the answer is Mark Andrews. Cool. That's uh, that's all we need to know. Mm -hmm. But it's I feel like I've been getting all these different answers. And it's going to be one of those things where everybody's going to have a week. It's going to be a – yeah, Bateman's going to have weeks. But at the end of the day, I think Kirk just feels safer for Dynasty squads. That's going to do it for this episode. If you want to get all of our Dynasty rankings, you get them at ultimatedraftkit.com. And we will get to talk to you next week about some of our Dynasty My Guys mm. for the year. With a special episode. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. If you want to take your Dynasty skills to the next level, check out the fantasyfootballers.com.